Hello and welcome to Second Watch, your direct line to the Second Mass. I am your host, Will Wheaton. Let's say hello to actors Drew Roy, Sarah Carter, Doug Jones, Seychelle Gabriel via satellite, and executive producer Rayme Abushan right here in studio. Hello, everyone. Hello. hello. Welcome. Hey. Thank you very much for being here tonight. Um, in this episode, it looked like the humans in the Volm were so close to pulling off a major strike against the Ishveni when things went terribly terribly wrong. <laughs> Remy, I heard that the idea for this episode was spawned actually from a production <laughs> issue. We had one idea of where we wanted to go and we couldn't do it at all. And we scrambled and scrambled and suddenly thought, what if the mole still has one final trick left in her, now that we know who it is, and it looks like this is it. And it, it's funny how those things happen. That's what I love about these things, is that you find out stuff like that that I had no idea, that no idea. we actually mm -hmm. could have been going this way and then it goes this way, which happens from time to time on the show, but we never know about well, it. Well, one, one of yeah. the fun things is, is that we, we start out our season kind of knowing where we want to go, but you have to allow for dynamics mm -hmm. and the happy accident. And as I've said before, one of the fun things, again, about television is... As writers, we're playing jazz with the actors, and we throw out something, and then we watch the actors take it and mess around with it and feed it back to us, and that sort of starts to create a rhythm and a life of its own that you don't anticipate. And if you just stayed rigidly with, this is what we said we were going to do, and this is what we're going to do it, you miss out on some fun stuff. And I think this episode is a really clear example of that. Well, creativity is born from limitations, right? Limitations and collaboration is incredibly important, I think, in this case. So this episode was directed by uh, my friend and uh, former Enterprise shipmate, Jonathan Frakes. Yes. Um, and I texted him right before we came up here today. And I said, look, I'm doing Second Watch. What should I ask them about? <laughs> and, and he said that uh, I should ask you to talk about the very realistic sets and the horrible yet appropriate weather. <laughs> so I don't know what that means, but uh, anybody want to anybody wanna weigh in on, uh, on those, those subjects? Yeah, he, he was impressed by the weather, but that's just what we deal with on the show. I we actually got, to, uh, well, I guess my impression of this, this show is a little different than the actual, the, the entirety of it, of it, because <laughs> we shot everything um, in one day. Like, usually I work every day, yeah. and we shot all our stuff underground on our one set and uh so to me the weather was in beautiful. one day <laughs> you, all that stuff was in one day? everything was yeah. back to back to back we were the only two actors on that day yeah. weren't we yeah wow it was intense yeah, yeah i bet yeah. so and how many cameras are you guys using in uh on, on a daily are you are you two th yeah, yeah you're just two two on a regular basis sometimes yeah. we'll bring in a third camera yeah wow. you couldn't fit much more in our little little cubby hole that yeah, we were shooting in it <laughs> felt very claustrophobic to me it was, what, was it as small as it, it was. as it, it, as it feels? Small, but that also was such a gift back, though. You know, it was almost yeah. like cruising into the playhouse that you're going to then, you know, we only have each other and sort of in, intensified things. This is something I wanted to ask you about. Uh, Drew and, uh, and Sarah, so Maggie and Hal have endured a lot. They're like, they have just, they have really been through a lot of things that most couples don't normally have to go through, right? I would agree. So, <laughs> so, so now, now, that, now that they have survived. In fact, no couple, I don't think, has ever gone through. Post-apocalyptic dating is not. It's not, not, not that easy? So wait a minute, so postapocalypticdating.com is just, yeah. that's, that's, yeah. that's just a phishing site? <laughs> yeah. Great. I have to go, if you're my bank, cancel my credit card right now, okay. please. Um, so I'm just wondering, like, they have now survived being buried alive together. What do you think is, is coming up in their relationship? You know, we're getting near the end of this season, and you can do anything you want with these guys next year, all right? So we've seen them endure incredible things. What do you do? Well, I feel like getting stuck down there let a lot of things bubble to the top. Because, you know, first, you're horrified that you might you know, never get out of this situation. And a few things came out. There were a lot of things that had been unsaid between the two of us because we I basically came back to becoming the normal how and then yeah. left. And then now I'm back and we're stuck down here. And then the closer we get to uh to actually dying, I think we then pull back around and we find that love that has kept us together this whole time. One of the special things about the beginning of the season is that 
I'm not the how that can take care of her. She's having to take care of me. And that deep-rooted love is what we have. But at the same time, we're still on very rocky ground, and there's a lot more to come. Does that match up with your, your interpretation of the relationship and where, where Maggie's coming from? Yeah, I think we were forced into processing everything extremely quickly. So we went through the full spectrum of the rage that was in there to be expressed. But Maggie's kind of cool on the edge of death. And yeah. she has a certain amount of grace and like Buddhist sense of humor in her. Um, she's also high on lack of oxygen. Uh, it was such a, a great scene to play. We, mm. we hadn't had anything like that so far, but then at the end, yeah, she pulls through for Hal again. I have a little bit of a crush on her. You do? I just, oh, yeah. I, I, I do. Are you I, 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 I. <laughs> Hey, hey. <laughs> I have loved her since the first time she came on screen. Me last too. Year. Like I just there's there's something about her, but but I but I I love how confident and how in charge of herself she is. I think she's a terrific role model. She's a wonderful, wonderful role model for young women, for young anybody who has sort of made mistakes, mm -hmm. but learned from them, mm -hmm. and moved on, and, and come through adversity stronger. And I really love that about her. Yeah, and, me too. And, and, it's, and it's, I can tell, I can tell that you love it when you talk about her. You know, there's actors who are like, yeah, it's my character, whatever, but I see you, like, you, you carry her like a child, like, like she's, a, like she's a, a thing you care about. Yeah. So, all right, so, <laughs> here's the thing, though. What? Eventually the war is gonna be over, or everybody's gonna be dead. And I love what she says about how, Living is hard, dying is easy. Yeah, right. I loved that. Uh. Boy, when, when I, I read that script, uh, you know, a, f a long time ago when I was preparing for this, it was everything I could do to not go quote that and just put it online. Because it's, <laughs> so, it's so great. What is Maggie going to do when the fighting is over? Because this is a huge part of what drives her. Yeah. That's an interesting question. Yeah. That will be addressed. Uh. <laughs> um, did, you're, you're bang on. I don't, can't speak too much about it. It's addressed in the finale. All um, right. And yeah, she's, I think she's just sort of under, she understands she's going to be a fighter even in life. So she'll probably find the edge all the time just to feel alive. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah. So she's a danger seeker? She's a danger seeker. We're very lucky to have Seychelle Gabriel joining us now via satellite. Um, Seychelle, hello. Lourdes has yeah. recently been exposed to everyone in Charleston as the mole. So I want to know what it was like for you to play this big, bad character. Uh, I, Greg Beeman told me that, uh, that Greg and Ramey decided early on in the season to tell you that you were going to be the mole. I would love for you to talk a little bit about the choices you made throughout the season uh, leading up to your reveal. Um, yeah, when they told me, it was... It was on set, and they were like, okay, you're not allowed to tell anybody this. And I thought it was a joke. And then they were like, no, 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 we're serious. <laughs> and I had to go back and do a scene with Moon and be like, oh, okay, so I have an entirely new motive for this scene that I didn't know about and until now. It was the when, um, when she wants to go grab some shawarma from Pope Town and then her water breaks. But, uh, and I say that I'm going to turn in because I've had a long day and yeah, I'd check on a guy in some other bed. And, um, but it was because I needed to go and kill the president. I mean, Manchester. And so, uh, yeah, um, it kind of, you, things kind of wavered, uh, throughout the season with, with like me being the mole and then me not being the mole and then me being the mole again. But I always kind of thought that I was going to end up the mole so it was always in the back of my mind and there was always I always had to kind of uh, go through the scenes and kind of strate strategically figure out like why I would do certain things like uh, from an Ashveni point of view and and um the the hardest thing for me I think at first was uh trying to figure out what would make me actually do these things and compel me to do these things um in my own head you know how because I'm not thinking about it. It's just a natural thing for Lourdes, I think, you know, because they're just, they have just infiltrated her. And um, it's just, and, and then it just dawned on me, you know, I, I, it's, it's just, it was the same motives as fighting for the second match. 
except it happened to be the Ishveni. Were you able to keep this a secret all season long from the other uh, actors? And have you been able to keep it a secret from when it was filmed to now from your friends and family? Or was it just too awesome to, uh, to keep to yourself? I pride myself on my secrecy skills. Um, <laughs> I didn't let anybody know, except for Moon after she had left to go have her baby at home. Um, and I told her she was not allowed to tell anybody else. Um, but I think she told my mom. Um, oh, oh. But <laughs> no, no. Yeah. <laughs> she told on her. <laughs> uh, well, listen, y you were great. And, uh, and, and I, I really enjoyed watching you be a bad guy. And thanks a lot for uh, taking some time out um, for where, from wherever you are in the world right now to come and join us today on Second Watch. Doug Thank Jones, you. Yes, sir. you play Cochise. Yes. Yes. Now, a lot of people might not know that because you don't look like a giant alien. Thank you for yes. that. Yes. But uh, as we near the end of our uh, episode today, I want to ask you a couple of Cochise things because oh. I, I find him really compelling and incredibly interesting. And we've been, mm -hmm. we've been making jokes all, all season long here on Second Watch about his volmanity. His, yes, and, yes. and what did you say? His, his, his volmies. His well, volmies. In this episode, we deal with my volmies and yeah. the loss of them. Right. So good. that scene, <laughs> that scene in, in particular, yeah. um, it's, it's heart-wrenching. Yeah. when he is talking about the loss of all of his comrades and knowing that he has come across the stars to yeah. be here mm -hmm. to save this planet and to, uh, to, to just to do some good, mm -hmm. right? And I think we all know how we would react to a situation like that as humans, but he's an alien. Right. He has a different point of view about himself. He has a different way of dealing with things. We've seen all season long that he's very, like, very even keeled. So how do you, as a human actor, find <laughs> what is yeah. the appropriate style of Volm grief right. to, to express in that scene? I think it's best told when, when Cochise is on the gurney, uh, when he's telling uh, uh, Lourdes, uh, don't bother reviving me, uh, let me go. I was just trying to let them, I have failed. I failed my people. Uh, you know, they're all gone now, and that is a pride issue, and I, I kind of took it as a Volm thing that we, uh, we, there's no reason to live after you've failed that, that miserably. Oh my That's kind of how I took it. Yeah. And it was, it was Tom Mason who talked me out off the ledge, and he grabbed my hand and told me, you know, he was quoting me back to myself again, didn't yeah. you tell me that this, this is this and that? And I was like, oh, God, I guess you're right. So, uh, so that's when I, I told him, well, I do have a way of reviving myself. If you just let me be, let me be. But I think this is the lowest that Cochise has ever been in his life. He's never felt this kind of devastation before. And it was a new thing for him to have that emotion. Uh, so he just dealt with it as best he could, which was, I'm going to shut down and check out. <laughs> yeah. Do you think that he will be able to take back some of that human spirit? Like, if he is able to return to his people, if he's able mm -hmm. to, assuming that they fix things up on Earth and he can go get right. off to a new place, will he be able to take some of that with him? Oh, absolutely. Will he take it back? I think, I think absolutely. This and maybe, is, this maybe carry it to other planets? I would certainly hope so. I think this, this entire season has been a cultural exchange for the humans and the Volm. Yeah. Uh, from my perspective, from my characters. Uh, we have learned so much from each other. I, of course, I came thinking that I'm, I'm the superior being. I'm going to bless you with my knowledge and my know-how. But I've taken so much back from these humans uh, that, um, that I, I will absolutely carry on with this and take, hopefully take some of this, this emotional connection these people have back to the Volm. Maybe we can better ourselves from it. I would like to just sit and talk with you, just <laughs> not here, just about him, yeah. because your your what you have done to create him is so incredibly interesting to me. Yeah. Uh, it's it's interesting to me as an actor, and it's interesting to me as a fan of the show. Well, he's so beautifully and, written. I, I have to give that credit, uh, you know. But again, it's that jazz thing. I mean, yeah, we, I can see that. I see the collaboration what, at work. We saw something that we didn't anticipate that Doug brought in the first few scenes of the season to that character, and we suddenly went, "Okay, we can let's work with that." And that that's the fun part about television. That's why I've stayed with it for 23 years. You know, I mean, it's just it's amazing to watch that that interaction happen. Well, we're going to find out where this is all going next week. Yep. It's, it is going to be a long seven days for, uh, for, for some of us. Um, so you guys, thank you for taking Second Watch with me tonight. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you for wonderful work as always. And uh, next week here on Second Watch, we will wrap up this season with actors Noah Wiley, 
Drew Roy, Sarah Carter, Maxim Knight, and Jesse Schramm. You can find plenty of Falling Skies trivia and take a look behind the scenes right here on TNTdrama.com. And until next time, keep the resistance strong.